Right before we get into this real-world review, I want to thank two companies. One is Allen's Camera at allenscamera.com, and the other is Lens Rentals from lensrentals.com for hooking us up with the gear we needed to review the Sony A9. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com here at Talon Energy Stadium to do a real world review of the Sony A9 out here shooting the Philadelphia Union. So the challenge today is to use the Sony A9 to see how we can do shooting sports. They are saying that the A9 is a great sports camera, so that's what we're out here to do. The two lenses that I have are the 70 to 200 2.8 G Master as well as the 24 to 70 2.8 G Master. Now we all know that Sony doesn't have bigger glass just yet, so we will see how this challenge works out, but let's start shooting. To start off the shoot, before we even came into the stadium, they had some drummers outside, and I went and captured some images of them, and I think they turned out really well. This camera has the potential to be deadly and cause a lot of people to switch when there is more glass. They do have the 12 to 24 coming over. They do have a 16 to 35. They don't have anything longer than 70 to 200 2.8 in fast glass. They are releasing the 100 to 400, but that is a 4.5 to 5.6, which is still not the greatest for a professional body. This camera has a brand new 24.2 megapixel full frame sensor that allows you to shoot at 20 frames per second because it utilizes an electronic shutter. That means you're gonna get silent shooting if you want it. It also means you can go up to 1 32,000th of a second with your shutter speed. More cowbell, more cowbell. We'll say it is fun shooting. I almost want to shoot video. That was cool. Now before the game started, I wanted to get some photos of my friend Dave Leno, who so happens to be a broadcaster. So we went up to the broadcast booth and took some portraits, took some behind the scenes candids. And one of the things that came in handy that I absolutely loved was the new IAF. It locked on his eye and I've never seen a camera do this. And I love the fact that I could leave it in continuous focus, press the button to find the eye and bam, it found the eye. Even as Dave moved left or right or front and back, it stayed locked on his eye. Yeah. That is an incredible feature. That is cool. I forgot it has an EVF for the preview of the image, so zoomed in. Right. I don't have to sit here and try to see it in the light. I can go like this, right. and I'm seeing a full in-zoom shot. That looks awesome. Now let me cut in here real quick. If you want to take better pictures in only 11 days, I created a free mini video course that you can sign up for right now at fronosphoto.com 11 days. One of my favorite things about the Sony cameras are the electronic viewfinders. This one has a 3.7 million dot EVF, which looks incredible when you're looking through it because it's showing at 120 frames a second refresh rate. Everything inside the camera on the EVF looks incredible. It was like I was watching a TV show because as I was taking three, four, five shots in a row, I had no viewfinder blackout, which made me be able to see everything that was going on. It was kind of like watching a movie. It was pretty cool. Now one of the questions I have, is this the first A9 in a series of other A9 cameras? Will we see an A9R or an A9S to go along with it? We'll have to wait and see. Kickball is next. This camera has multiple custom function buttons. Now what I did is set the C2 to ISO so I could quickly change the ISO and I set C1 to be able to change the focus modes quickly. But they also have the function button on the back of the camera which lets you use the LCD or the EVF 
to change those functions quickly as well. It's very similar to the Q button in Canon and the I button in the Nikon. Speaking of buttons, it's not easy to go from AFC to AFS. You have to press a button, turn a dial. It's not as simple as what Canon has in the 5D Mark IV where you can map one of the back buttons to just press it to go from AFC to AFS. One of the greatest things about using an EVF is that you see your exposure in action. As you make a change to this, that is going to happen, but you see it all in real time. For example, when I was photographing Dave, I thought that would be a great opportunity to get a silhouette. So all I needed to do was bump up my shutter speed, watch the clouds and all the colors pop in the background as Dave went dark. That was easy. I didn't have to take my eye off the viewfinder to chimp to look at the image to see if I got exactly what I needed because I got it in the EVF. Here's a quick tip for you mirrorless shooters is when you are not shooting for any amount of time, turn the camera off because if you leave it on, the EVF and then the LCD screen are still going to be active, which means they're chewing up precious battery power. So if I'm a photographer who needs to shoot in complete silence because you don't want to make noise, something like if you're shooting for commercials or you're shooting stills for movies, you can't use a DSLR unless you're using what's called a blimp, which makes the shutter sound silent. Well, why would you want to go out and get a camera like that, like a DSLR, when you have a camera like this that gives you professional quality results with a camera that has a silent shutter? One thing you'll need to be cognizant of when you're using the IAF is if you have multiple people in the frame, you're going to have to try to find the one person you want to focus on. So for example, when I was in the broadcast booth, I wanted to have it on Dave. So in order to do that, I kind of had to cut the other person out, hold the button down, it locked on Dave's eye, I came back over and started taking pictures. Or if you're further back and it can't find the eye exactly because the head's smaller, it finds the entire face. It doesn't get any better than that. I wish Nikon and I wish Canon all had that functionality. Awesome. Now this is supposed to be a pro level camera, but if it's a pro level camera, why did they put in two SD card slots with one of them being UHS-1 and the other being UHS-2? The problem there is if you're shooting with both cards, it's slower to get the files from the buffer to the card. On top of that, Sony created the XQD card, so you would have thought that a pro camera would get a pro level card. It is true. SD cards, they're not professional high-end cards. They're made of plastic. Though they are good and very reliable, an XQD card is so much faster and it would have saved time on transferring files from the buffer to the camera as well as from the card to the computer. So after leaving the broadcast booth, it was time to go down to field level and get a spot to shoot the game. Now I had to keep in mind that I'm using a 70 to 200. So why did I come out here to choose to shoot soccer even though Sony doesn't have the long glass to allow us to do that? Now if they did give me the 100 to 400, which isn't out on the market yet, I don't think I would have used it because it's a 5.6. This A9 is a professional sports camera. That's what they're saying it is, so I want it to come out to a professional soccer game to run it through its paces. Now if I had my choice and hockey was still going on, I would have shot hockey. Track the ball, track the ball. Oh, I tracked the ball! In some
some ways, the 70 to 200 is limiting out at a game like this, but in other cases, it's much easier and more versatile than having a 600 millimeter and then having to switch bodies or switch lenses to try to get that other shot. Now, it's a very small set of people that actually need the larger glass, but coming out to shoot a soccer game, you should have a 400 millimeter or at least a 302.8 to try to fill that frame as much as possible. Now, some of the Sony diehard fans will tell you that the solution to the glass issue is to just get a Metabones adapter and use your Canon glass on this camera. Now to me, unless I'm getting native lenses, I don't want to have to worry about getting an adapter and possibly losing quality or losing functions that otherwise would have been there. This is a pro camera. I need glass on this camera. When you're taking photos, no matter how many frames a second you're shooting them, there is no blackout in the viewfinder when you're using the electronic shutter. It seemed like I was watching a game on TV because I would take a picture, the little silver box shows up so you know that you're taking a picture, and I didn't miss anything because I could see it the whole time and track the action. I got all that so cool. Because you had no viewfinder blackout. So even though this camera lets you shoot at 20 frames a second, that's if you choose to shoot compressed RAW. Now personally, I want to shoot uncompressed because I want the best file. Now when you do that, you go down to 12 frames a second instead of 20. Is it that big of a deal? No, because you really don't need 20 frames a second. Now, if you do choose to shoot with the mechanical shutter, you're going to be left with only five frames a second. That's why Sony is touting this as a sports camera and want you to use the electronic shutter to take advantage of that 20 frames a second, which is honestly absolutely insane. I love that when I hit focus, the button halfway down, it finds something. It's, it's always close. It's snappy. One of the things that should not happen in a pro level camera is that I'm waiting for the buffer to write to the card when I want to preview some of my images or go into the menu system. It was taking a really long time to transfer the files to both cards. I always shoot redundant. If I have two card slots, I want to take the same raw files and have it go to slot one and slot two, and that should absolutely not slow down my shooting capabilities or the capabilities of previewing the image or getting into the menu system. Still saving them to the card. It's 30 seconds after I did a burst. <laughs> 30 seconds after a burst, still recording to the cards. That's where XQD would come in handy. This camera has 693 autofocus points that cover 93% of the viewfinder. That's a ton of focus points, and I hope I'm able to find the right one when I'm trying to get the photo I want to get. You might think that 693 is too much, but Sony has some really awesome autofocus capabilities that lets the camera make a lot of the decisions for you. Now, one of the features that Sony is pushing the most is its lock-on AF feature, where they're saying that in sports, it rarely misses. Now, I can tell you, when the ball was bouncing towards me, I locked my focus on it, and it kept tracking it as the ball rolled by. I don't know that any other camera on the market would have been capable of tracking that ball. I tracked the soccer ball the whole way. <laughs> it, fought, it tracked it like nothing ever did. For following the subjects, I didn't know if it would hit the right subject that I wanted it to hit, but I was really blown away by the autofocus capabilities of this camera. It kind of made shooting fun again because something could happen quick and I found myself just holding the button halfway down and it would acquire focus where I wanted it. And then if it wasn't where I wanted it, I could quickly move the focus point, reacquire it, and bam, it was tracking the subject while I was shooting 12 frames a second or more. This does have a touchscreen that allows you to do some tilting, but not very far. And on top of that, there are almost no touchscreen options or functionalities when you're using this camera. You can't use the menu system and touch it. You can't pinch and zoom on an image to zoom in. You literally have to hit the zoom in button or somehow double tap on it, and then you still can't pinch to zoom, but then you can move around it. I find it almost completely useless, so why is it even in there?
Now with the 70 to 200 on this body, I felt that the weight distribution wasn't very good. You feel your hand tilting forward because it's a very heavy lens. Now it's a great lens, it's nice and sharp and fast focusing, but I always thought that going mirrorless meant that it was lighter and you didn't have to worry about heavy lenses. But in this case, if you want pro quality, you need the heavier glass, which means you need to work out a little harder. Now let me cut in here real quick and say that if you're watching this video, it's probably because you own at least one piece of gear. Now my question to you is how do you organize that gear so you know what you have and what it's worth? Well, if you're not sure, check out my new app called My Gear Vault. It's the best way to input, organize, and protect your gear so you know what you have and what it's worth. You can download it right now for free at MyGearVault.com. This camera has built in five axis steady shot, which will help you when you're shooting photos as well as shooting video. So this is nice because any lens that you put on it will then become an image stabilized lens. And even if you have an image stabilized lens, it will almost act as double stabilization. <laughs> Now there's been some reports that there's banding issues with this camera when you use the electronic shutter. And did I see that? Yes, when I was previewing some of the images, now very few of them, I noticed there was banding issues. It's kind of interesting when you see the guy with the white shirt and the white pants out of focus, and there's banding. It's kind of weird and I hope this is something that they can fix or I hope it doesn't happen on a killer shot that I love versus a shot that's not a keeper. <laughs> I can't have that banding. I just got hit with beer. Now being that this is a pro camera, they say that it does have some weather sealing capabilities. But the question is, will it hold up as well as the Nikon or the Canon? In this case, we shot it at a soccer game. It was about 80 degrees. It wasn't raining, except for when beer got thrown on me. But other than that, it handled everything very well. So I do wish that this thumb impression was deeper. It just seems to hurt my finger a little bit. This camera shoots 4K video up to 30 frames a second at 100 megabits a second, full frame. And to see how that quality looks, well, you're looking at it because we're using it right now. Now the reason this camera can shoot full frame 4K is because it takes a 6K readout and downsizes it to 4K. Canon and Nikon can't even do that in 4K. Now for video shooters out there, you get a lot of professional features including zebra lines and focus peaking, but why did they leave out S-Log is beyond me. But is this something that could be implemented in a firmware update? We'll have to see what Sony decides to do. Now if you're really looking to shoot more video, you may want to look at the A7 series, but if you shoot stills and video, this is probably going to do a pretty good job. The ISO range of this camera is 100 to 51,200 natively, and I didn't get to push it terribly too far out here as it was sunny for a lot of the game, but at the very end, I was pushing it to 8,000 ISO, and I can't tell you how good that is until I look at the images, but it seemed to look pretty good on the back of the camera. Boring, man. Hockey has shit in front of you all goddamn game.
One of the main issues with Sony cameras in the past is the battery life. Now they've doubled the battery life of this particular battery and when you add the grip you get to put two batteries in the camera and I found that the batteries were actually pretty good. We didn't go through too many of them. After close to 15-1600 pictures we only went through one battery completely. The price of the camera is $4,500, which is much less than the Canon and Nikon competitors, but you have to remember to get a grip, you have to spend another 350 bucks, so that brings it closer to its competitors' prices. At the end of the game, there was a fireworks show and I wasn't gonna shoot, but I decided that I might as well. And I have to say, the EVF was amazing and the autofocus was even better. I was watching fireworks in the sky and fireworks with the autofocus because it was bouncing around picking different things to focus on. Now, I don't think a DSLR is capable of moving the autofocus as fast as this autofocus system did because it has 693 autofocus points. Now, I found myself really happy to shoot with this camera. I didn't know what to expect. A lot of people think I'm not a fan of Sony. It's not that. It's that I needed to use it to see how good it was because there's so much hype behind it. So far from what I shot out here at the soccer game, I was really happy with the results that I saw. I loved how fast the autofocus was. I love the EVF. That is better than anything I've ever used because of the 3.7 million dots. I absolutely love those features, but the only way to see if this camera is something that I would switch to is to get the files back to the loft, edit them, and to see how they look. So here we are back at the loft to take a look at the final RAW files, but I want to remind you that you can download sample RAW files over on the website, as well as download the full res exported JPEGs to pixel peep for yourself. So let's get in to the images. So here's the first image. You may look at this and be like, why does it look not so good? Well, that's because I'm showing you it straight out of the camera. Now let me show you what it looks like edited. Boom the file comes to life. Now, how did this shot come about? I think that the EVF definitely helped with this in the pregame when we're up in the broadcast booth because there were lights coming down from the ceiling, so we had mixed lighting, and we had the light coming in from outside. So when I'm looking through the EVF, I'm like, well, I know that I want some details from outside to balance with inside, and that's exactly what I was able to do and then bring the file back in post-processing to look like this. Yes, I'm at 1 2,000th of a second at f2.8 at 800 ISO, but it looks fantastic. Even printed it out, and this print looks amazing. So the files look like you can bring them to really great places, especially the raw files, because that's what I was editing. Now moving on to the next one, this is a cool portrait of Dave just sitting there using the 24 to 70 2.8. One of the things that I want to point out about this camera is that you have 93% focus point coverage. That means the focus points almost go all the way out to the edge. In my D5 and in the 1DX Mark II, your focus points do not go all the way to the edge. So you almost, you know, when you see a lot of headroom on vertical shots, that's because a lot of people either have to lock their focus in and recompose and try to get it right, or they just shoot it right where the focus point is, and then there's a lot of extra headroom. In this case, it's close, and in this image, I'm not sure that the Nikon D5 or the Canon 1DX Mark II would have had a focus point that would have lined up with his eye without me having to lock in and recompose. Now it's pretty close, but this just means that if you've got subjects on different angles or different edges of the frame, you don't have to lock in and then recompose and possibly miss the shot because focus points go all the way out to the edge. But let's dive in closer to this image. Super duper sharp all the way through. I'm at f 2.8, 1 1250th of a second, ISO 800. You see no issues, no banding issues, no moraying issues in the tie. The colors look tremendous. I mean, this is a pinstriped suit with with what are these things called? They're called windows. I don't like windows in suits. That's personally me, but it looks good on Dave. But you don't see any issues. And it's super sharp, super colorful, and the print looks absolutely amazing. So here you may be questioning, Jared, why were you at 1 16,000th of a second? 
Well, I'll explain to you exactly how this shot came about. I was taking photos of Dave and I was more exposing for him inside when I was like, this would be a great opportunity to do a silhouetted shot. So instead of possibly missing the shot, I didn't try to change my ISO and lower that to balance with outside. I just bumped my shutter speed until the EVF showed me exactly what I wanted. That's one of the reasons I love the EVF is I see exactly what I'm getting. And I will tell you that my exposures seem to be much closer when I'm processing because of the EVF, because I'm seeing basically the results. Basically you're seeing chimping without actually chimping in real time, you're getting feedback from the histogram, from the meter, from the actual image. You have three different things that you can look at to make sure that that image is spot on where you wanted it. Now the 16,000th of a second, good luck getting that in a DSLR. The majority of the pro ones stop at 1 8,000th of a second and can't go further than that. So this on the A9 is tremendous and it doesn't hurt the image quality at all because I like the way this image looks. Now moving on, I'm showing you this wider shot because they are filming live to channel six where the game was being broadcasted, which means, well, you don't want to be that guy that's shooting a lot of frames that's making a ton of noise. Like my Nikon D5 is nowhere near silent, even in silent mode. Now this time using the electronic shutter in the A9, it can be completely silent. Now I had it on just for a little bit of noise so it looked, you know, so I could hear the shutter going, but that didn't affect these guys at all. And I think somewhere in the future, you may get to a point where when you're going to an event, something like a political event where you hear a ton of loud shutters now, they may start to mandate that you need to use an electronic shutter or a silent shutter in order to shoot. That would also come in handy if you're shooting weddings and you don't want to be a distraction or if you're doing something like a Broadway play where you don't want to make any noise or they'll throw a shoe at you and hit you and get you in trouble. So let's keep moving on. I do love this shot, by the way. I, I love the candid nature of it. Now, this picture right here isn't the greatest image in the world, but I want to talk about a feature in this camera that made it awesome. The feature that is. Now, here's Dave and here's his commentator buddy, and there were hot lights on because they were just filming for TV. Now the coolest feature that I found in this camera is the IAF. It finds the eye or the face and even if the subject is moving left or right or forward or backwards, as long as it found the eye, the focus point stays locked in continuous focus. It stays locked on the subject. Now that is great to make sure you get the eye nice and sharp. I'm all about getting the eye nice and sharp. The other guy's not sharp or in focus. That's because I wasn't lined up exactly in the middle. If I was to have more time or to actually get the shot right, I should have shot around f7.1 instead of f3.5 or gotten straight on and had them on the same plane. So that's a quick tip for you guys out there. Make sure if you're doing multiple group shots or two or more that they're on the same plane or to be safe, bump your aperture up to a higher place so you get a little bit more leeway. So now we move on to the game. Let me tell you how I was shooting this. I was shooting at 12 frames a second, not 20. Now it's kind of interesting when Sony was pushing this camera out, they're like, it's 20 frames a second. Well, yeah, it's 20 frames a second when you shoot compressed raw. The compressed files are 25 megabytes a piece. And when you shoot uncompressed RAW, you only get 12 frames a second because those files are 50 megabytes a piece. Now, if you want to shoot the mechanical shutter, you're getting only five frames a second. So I chose to shoot the soccer game in the 12 frames a second to hopefully get the best quality possible from the RAW file. Now, I'm not really sure what you're losing between compressed and uncompressed. The files look almost exactly the same, and I'll show you two examples, or you can download an example of a picture that I photographed at a Little League game to see for yourself if you spot any differences between those two files. But I chose to shoot at 12 frames a second to try to get the best quality possible. So what focus mode was I using? Well, I used the lock on expandable focus. That's the one that Sony was pushing really hard for sports, saying that you will find the subject 
and then it will lock on and follow and track that subject all the way through. Now, Nikon and Canon have something similar to this. I've used it in the Nikon. It's the 3D AF, which works incredibly well when you're shooting something like airplanes or fighter jets moving. And I don't always use this type of mode because sometimes it misses, but it's close meaning it will focus on the hand when it should have been focusing on the chest or the face, and that's just something you have to deal with to find out which situation is right for which focus mode that you use. So let's take a look at this image. I'm gonna start right here and acknowledge the one four thousandth of a second. I'm shooting sports, I'm shooting outdoors. I want that faster shutter speed. This is a sports camera, I wanna freeze that action. So I shot it at one four thousandth of a second, and at 1250 ISO, that's not that big of a deal. So let's zoom in on this photo. It looks pretty good, right, in terms of focus. But when you look a little closer, it looks like it's focused somewhere around his hand, or the ball, or his foot. And this means that the critical focus is off just slightly. Is it that big of a deal? I'm a big proponent of focus, so it's not a deal breaker, it's just that this is how this focus mode works. Now I stuck with it for the entire game because that is one of the major modes that Sony is pushing and it works very well in most situations. And this is just one of the images I wanted to show you because it seems like it's just a little off in his face, but, but this is pixel peeping when we zoom straight in. If this was printed out, you wouldn't really notice much of a difference. Now let me cut in here real quick. Did you know that I have four different educational video guides? Well, you can head on over to fronosphoto.com slash guides to check out a free preview of all four of those guides. So let's move on to the next image, and this is where we talk about banding. Now, I made a separate video that said my Sony A9 has a banding issue. The reason I made that is I wanted to point out the fact that I noticed the banding in the images in only, it was 2% of the 1905 images that I took, which is a ton of images, the 1905, and 2% isn't a lot, but if one of these were the best of the best keeper shots, they could have been ruined by the banding. Now, this is just something that happens with electronic shutters. It's gonna happen more often with a mirrorless camera than you're ever gonna notice with a DSLR, because honestly, I haven't noticed shots that ever had banding with any of my DSLRs throughout history. History. I've noticed flickering issues, but that isn't the same thing as looking at this banding. Now, the reason I made that video is I wanted to acknowledge it and show you that it was there, but I also want to let you know it was very rare that it showed up, and it's really not a deal breaker. Sony's done a tremendous job with being able to get these mirrorless cameras and these electronic shutters to not get these issues any longer like they used to have. They're getting much better. So let's look at it real quick. This is what the banding looks like. And we've figured out that it's coming from the LED boards along the sidelines. They're putting out different colors at fast rates, which then somehow lines up with the shutter speed that I was using, and it showed up. So you can see it's not really in this, actually, when you zoom in and it, fo and, it, and, it, and it locks in, you can actually see this is what that banding looks like. Moving on, you can see a little bit of banding in the soccer ball right in front of where those LED boards were. Now, this is interesting because it's really strong on this one. It's really bad in this situation. They say it shows up more in mixed lighting situations. And I think from other people's reviews, they've stated that they didn't have any issues. So that's a good sign. It's just I had to show it because it showed up. Now this is interesting because as I went vertical, the lines moved vertical, which means that's the sensor. That's what it's coming off of. It's not just the lights creating these lines. It's part of the sensor and the light and the flickering and all of the different things that other people have said, but it showed up. So it showed up in 2% of the images and it's really not a deal breaker. I know some people are hoping that this is a, a reason why I would say don't go and pick up this Sony A9, but it's not. It's just something that's there. Sony is actually innovating and pushing the future of photography much faster than most of the other camera companies out there. And so this is just something to acknowledge to know that it's possible. Now, I will say I shot in two situations. I shot the soccer game and I shot a Little League baseball game. So that's what I'm reporting back on. I would love to know how this would work at a concert in a low light situation with different LED lights all around. That's gonna be the end all and be all for me personally in making a decision at the end of the day. So I will report back when I get another Sony A9 to rent and I will let you know how it works at a concert. But let's get back to looking at the images. So 
this is an action shot. One sixty-four hundredth of a second, uh, twelve fifty ISO, and this one looks really good. Um, the way that my editing is done kind of brings out more grain, more noise, because I pump up the contrast. It's all personal preference with how you edit. This is what it looks like when it's flatter or straight out of the camera. And then when I go ahead and bump my exposure or bump my clarity and contrast a little bit, it may introduce more noise or grain. But again, keep in mind, this is shot with a 70 to 200. I am zoomed in one to one now. You're going to see some noise. You're going to see some perception of grain but when you print it out, you're never going to notice that difference. And moving on, I just picked this shot because, let's zoom in, it's an action shot, he's moving nice and sharp on the shirt, shows you the bokeh blown out with the 70 to 200, but we all know that Sony doesn't have big high-end glass just yet. They are releasing a 100 to 400, but that's not a pro piece of glass that a professional soccer photographer or a, a baseball photographer or football photographer is gonna take onto the sidelines because the bokeh would not look as good as what it does with this. So that's one of the things to keep in mind. We've talked about it time and time again with Sony that they don't have that longer glass, but I thought it was important to get out to the soccer game because that's what this camera's designed for and get some shots. So just zooming in here, it looks really good. We're at one five thousandth of a second, F3.2, uh, 1250 ISO, 200 millimeters, filling the frame as much as I could. We don't see any banding issues and he's not that far away from where the LED boards were. So you can see that it wasn't that that big of a deal in every single shot. It wasn't really in most of the shots. Now moving on, I was a little late to move over to this shot. I think I was tracking something else and then I quickly moved over and the focus jumps fast. Now people ask, they go, how was it compared to a Nikon D5 or a Canon 1DX Mark II? And without sitting there looking through one and looking through the other, it's hard to say. And now that's a good sign for the Sony A9 because I, didn't perceive much of a difference between, basically I wasn't missing shots because I was waiting for the autofocus. Now that's what I think people wanna know. How was the autofocus? I think it kept up really well, and I didn't sit there and say, wow, my D5 would have got this, or my D5 wouldn't have gotten this. I actually feel that the Sony may have gotten some shots that I may not have been able to get because of the extra focusing points all the way out at the ends of the frames because of that 93% focus point coverage. So that's a cool thing about it. So I wanted to go ahead and crop this. I'm not a personal guy that crops my own work, but with the Sonys, without having that big glass, you still need to possibly crop to bring it in closer, which at the end of the day, if this is just for web usage, is gonna be perfectly fine for what you're doing. So let's zoom in and see how the focus did here. I think the focus nailed it on this one. He looks nice and sharp. The ball looks pretty good frozen here. This guy looks like he works out because look at those legs. You know, he definitely does. Um, so that looks good. Now this shot, I was super excited. Again, I was focused in on the guy who was going to kick it. And then when I knew he was going to kick it, I quickly whipped over to the goalie and I saw this image. I took a bunch of images and I was like, oh man, I missed it. But then I go to the next image and I'm like, well, the camera brought it right back. The focus is fast and it does hit. And, that, and that's important when you're shooting sports. And that's important to say for a mirrorless camera that it hit and was capable of holding itself uh, at a very high standard shooting the soccer. So I was really happy to get this shot. Then just showing you a crop in just in case you needed to crop it another time. So there's that. Now moving on to this shot outside. I love candids of kids out at the field or wherever they are. It's like getting candids of kids anywhere. Now this shot looks nice and sharp. The light was really, this was golden hour. The sun was starting to go down. It was almost away and we got this. But I do want to point out this in the background. This is what the LED board looks like when I'm shooting at one four thousandth of a second. Uh, it kind of shows up at other shutter speeds as well when you are, when the board's in the background. I will tell you, I didn't count any of the board shots like this. Uh, in that 2% of images that had banding. I think this is just the nature of the beast you have to deal with and ask yourself, is that distracting from the main image? Can you live with this? Is it really that big of a deal? And I'll let you guys figure that out. It's kind of distracting, but we also know in the old days when you looked at video and you saw the TV doing this thing with the lines, you're like, oh, that's just the scan lines on the TV. And let's look at the next one. Now, this is where the focusing points miss just a little bit. Well. A little bit means that the shot was totally out. It focused on this guy and it didn't jump over to this guy. 
So that's just one thing to be cognizant of when you're using that lock on AF. And as you'll see when I get into the baseball pictures moving later, you're gonna see why I jumped back into selecting it myself to not have it bounce around. And you'll see how the results looked for that as well. Um, moving on to the next one, focus again. It hit the ball, but it didn't hit this guy. So sometimes it's super quick. And if you have on that lock on AF, it may be thrown off by something else in the frame. And I'm sure there's settings in the camera that you could play with the different sensitivities to it. So that's gonna come down to just, you know, trial and error in that case. But in this case, this shot isn't usable. I mean, it kind of is usable, but it's not really good because he's out of focus. Um, again, now we're at 4,000 ISO, looking good. You see the noise and grain a little bit when you zoom in, but again, this is one-to-one, -one, printed out, looks perfectly fine. I'll just show you where it came out of the camera, and when you zoom in, you can see that it's mostly my editing that is introducing some of that noise and grain with just the style of how I edit. He's also in a darker part of the stadium. This part of the stadium seems to miss the lighting, and just it doesn't look as good because there's not as much light. Um, Boom, capture this guy in midair, happy with this shot, looked at the print, the print looks great. Where was the focus? It seems to be on this guy right here. It, critically focused wise, it may not be right, well, it's not right on his face, um, but I printed it out, looked fine. Well, actually, it looks tremendous. You guys can download this raw file and see it for yourself as well. Um, red card, guy getting a red card, thought this was a good shot. You can see the scan lines in the boards, how they run and how they, they represent here. It looks like an old printer that it's just, you know, those old dot matrix printers that were like and they, and they miss lines. Well, they actually miss lines and, and that's what it looks like. But I like that shot. Now this one's at 6400 ISO, looks really solid. Looks really solid. The focus did a great job on this one. We got him just kicking the ball. We got the goalie diving right there. Uh, and I'm really happy with the results, how they turned out for that. Now, I want to say something to those guys or gals who shoot with back button autofocus. If you shoot with back button autofocus, you can do that with this Sony. But one thing you need to be careful of is where the button placement is, is really close to the record video button. So you may find yourself accidentally hitting record video instead of the focus, which will cause you to miss a shot because you're recording video. So that's just something to be careful with if you shoot with back button focus. I personally don't, but there's a lot of people out there who do like doing that. So moving on right here, fireworks. They had some fireworks happening after the game. I put on that image stabilization inside the camera where it basically jiggles and jostles around the the image sensor and also had it working in tandem with the 70 to 200 with the OS in that to handhold shoot this. I wasn't at super slow shutter speeds, but this looks awesome to be able to handhold this. Oh, what I will tell you about the focus points when shooting the fireworks is I don't think a DSLR ever would be able to track the autofocus of a firework as it's exploding to get it where you want it. I had on the expanded lock AF for the fireworks. When the fireworks exploded, it looked like the focus points were exploding in the camera with green dots flying around and finding things to focus on. And you can see that I didn't miss my focus shooting the fireworks handheld, which is insane. So the autofocus points for that were spot on. Now let's move into the baseball game, the Little League game. Now I shot the Little League game for the most part at 20 frames a second. So I wanted to shoot the compressed because I wanted to see how 20 frames a second did out in another sporting environment. So that's exactly what I did here. I also started with the lock on expanded AF and look at this, I'm just gonna show you something. The first shot that I took out here focused in on the background. The next shot right after in those 20 frames now focused in on the pitcher. Now let's look at the third shot. And then the third shot decided to jump itself and focus in on the batter. Now, that's not exactly what I want to happen, so I switched over to just the expanded autofocus where you pick the focus points, and it still uses an expanded area. So not just one little square, it takes readings from around it, but at least I could stay locked on the pitcher, and if something else moves, it's not gonna be distracted, and then go out of focus where you don't want it. And if you're wondering what is this shadow area in the image, I was kind of wondering that as well, but I figured it out. It's because I'm shooting through a fence. Now, the metal's pretty thick, and that's what that shaded area is picking up. That's 
that's the fence out of focus right there causing that. Um, so there you go. Now moving on, this is with the AF tracking. This is great. I just go through the kid. He just struck out uh, third strike drop ball, so he's running the first, and it's nailing it. Every single time it's going through and it's nailing it right on as he's running. But look at this. It's like as he's running, you almost get three or four shots of, of him running. The 20 frames a second is insane. Insane. So I think it comes in handy when you're shooting sports like this, but also know that you're going to shoot a lot more pictures, which means a lot more gigs of files you have to deal with, which means editing process is much longer because you have to go through each image to decide which ones you're going to edit. So keep that in mind. And my quick tip is I don't care if you shoot 4,000 shots at an event, make sure you only deliver the best of the best of the best so people don't really know you shot 4,000. And being that you're shooting silent with an electronic shutter, they may never know that you're actually taking a picture. Then let me cut in here real quick and say, do you want to show the world that you shoot raw? Well, head on over to store.fronosphoto.com to check out all the I Shoot Raw t-shirts that I offer, as well as other accessories and even a custom I Shoot Raw Think Tank Retrospective 30 camera bag. So head over there right now. So moving on to the next one, I've never gotten the ball on the bat or in the frame so many times with my Nikon or the Canon 1DX Mark II as I was able to do in this situation because of 20 frames a second. And I'll get to more of that in just, just a minute. But this, this is one where the kid fouled it off. Ooh, yeah. And then that happened. So, uh, but watch his face. Let's just watch his face. Boom, boom. All of this is happening. It's almost like we're shooting video, which I'll talk about after I tell you about this. But this is, this is insane. Look at the, oh, ow, that hurts. Ow, that hurts. Yeah. That definitely doesn't look like it feels good. Now that reminds me of something like the Lee Harvey Oswald photo where Jack Ruby is shooting Lee Harvey Oswald and they caught the perfect moment. It's not like they were taking 20 frames a second back then. Now 20 frames a second is just four frames a second off of shooting video. I do think that in the future we will get to a place where consumer cameras and pro cameras alike will literally allow you to point the camera where you want it, then after the fact, pick out one of those individual raw frames and call it your image. They can pull 36 megapixel stills from an 8K RED camera, but that's 50 grand. So we will see that at some point. Moving on, ball right on the bat. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're looking for. They were in a shaded area. That's why I'm at uh, 640 ISO at 132 hundredth of a second. Let's keep moving through this. Um, another ball right on the bat. That's what I'm talking about. The fact that you could almost get the ball in there two or three times on almost every pitch is cool. Just know you're going to waste a lot of frames, especially if they don't swing. Same thing right here. This kid just made contact with the ball and ripped it uh, somewhere. He did a great job doing that. Um, so that's a cool shot. This one, you're going to be like, Jared, why were you at 5,000 ISO? because that's just where I was at. I bumped it up to see how the results would look at one four thousandth of a second. I used the IAF to lock on Dave's eye, who was out calling the Little League game. He went from soccer to then calling this the next day. But wow, that is sharp. That is right on. That is one of my favorite features in the camera, the IAF, because I am a stickler for focus on the eye, and that did awesome. Two more shots here. This kid hit a home run. I was actually shooting a little wider this time and it turned out to be good. When I shot it, I didn't know I got the ball, but there's the ball right there. Here's the kid swinging, hitting the home run, and then here's the follow through where he's watching the ball at the distance. So I loved it for shooting the Little League Baseball game. So at the end of the day, would I switch and purchase this camera? That seems to be the question that everybody wants to know. Now, before I answer that, I will say I enjoyed using this camera. I love so many features that it has that I wish my Nikons and I wish the Canons actually learned something from what Sony is doing and implemented that into their cameras. Sony is clearly leading the market in mirrorless technology and they are pushing the future fast, especially for pros. If I needed to take a camera somewhere and I needed to shoot silent or quiet, there is no other camera that I would pick up than this A9. It gives me what I want in a camera 
the 20 frames a second if I end up shooting compressed RAW versus the 12, even though 12 is perfectly fine. It gives me the EVF, which I absolutely love. It gives me the IAF, and for the sports, in terms of focusing, it didn't seem to miss. But like I said earlier, I wanna see how it works out at a concert to really determine if this camera is there just yet. But if I was told that all I could use is this Sony to go do a photo shoot, I don't think I would have a problem coming back with fantastic pictures. It's really, like I always say, it comes down to the photographer, not the camera, though the cameras can help in certain situations that other cameras may not be as good in because your Nikon's not gonna be silent, your Canon's not gonna be silent unless you purchase a blimp, and then it just doesn't work. A blimp is a way to silence the camera when you're on set, and there's really no need to do that when you've got a camera like this Sony. Now, in terms of glass, we know they're short on glass right now. I personally own 10 different Nikon lenses, everything from fish eyes all the way to 302.8s. I don't have anything beyond that, but I have a 300 f4 and a 105.14. The Sonys don't quite have the glass just yet. They also don't have the bigger glass to entice those professional photographers to switch over to the A9 just yet. They may get there in the future. Now what I want to say to Nikon and Canon is that you should be afraid, be very afraid of what Sony is doing. You guys are making great cameras in terms of the 1DX Mark II and the D5. They're awesome. But if you don't start pushing technology, if you don't come out with a camera that gets rid of the mirror and you start making a mirrorless, I, all I say is follow Sony's lead and try to replicate what they're doing if you really wanna survive and compete into this market into the next 10, 15, 20 years. If you don't, Sony's gonna take you over and become the de facto go-to for professionals. They're getting there, it's close. Now what I wanna say is who I think it's for. If you're somebody who shoots weddings, yes, you could look at the A7s or something along those lines, but this is a top of the line camera from Sony. It would do a great job and allow you to get the bride walking down the aisle and shoot 300 pictures of her walking down the aisle if that's what you wanted, or you could just shoot video. But if you need to shoot in places that are silent and still get high-end professional results, this camera is gonna do a great job for you. If you're doing sports, it's gonna do a great job, but you already know that there isn't a lot of glass and you just have to make that decision for yourself if you wanna jump into this market now or wait a little bit for something else. But at the end of the day, I was very happy with shooting with this camera. I love the way that the prints look. I love the way that the files look. I love the IAF, as you can tell. So there's a lot of things that I liked and there's some things that I didn't like, but it's all about weighing those pros and cons. Sometimes the DSLR offers something better and sometimes the mirrorless camera offers something better. And that's where I'll leave it. I wanna remind you, you can download the full res exported JPEGs over on the site, as well as some of the sample raw files. And that's it, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Jared Poland, froknowsphoto.com. See ya. So if you wanna check out that Sony A9 banding issue video, you can click up on the screen right here. And I wanna one more time remind you that if you do have gear, how do you input, organize, and protect it? Check out my Gear Vault. It's my free app. Go ahead and download it in the Apple App Store as well as on Android. And if you don't like it, go ahead and delete it. It's free.